over to my colleague, Julie Carroll Davis, who will moderate the presentation today. I'd like to provide some housekeeping notes. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please enter them into the chat box found usually on the right hand side of your screen and address it to all panelists. The session will be recorded and a link to the recording will be shared with you next week. Thank you. Over to you, Julie. Thank you, Simone. So, um, hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. As Simone said, I'm Julie Carroll Davis. I'm the Senior Vice President for the Global Content Alliances Group here at ProQuest. Um, I lead the team who negotiate and manage um, relationships with many thousands of our, our content partners across the globe um, and make sure that we are bringing content most important to faculty, researchers and students to our products. So today, this is the third in a series of webinars that we and our long term publishing partner, the Economist Intelligence Unit, have hosted together in the last year. Initially around the response to COVID, the COVID crisis, and now thankfully turning our focus to rebuilding a better and more sustainable future as we move through 2021 and beyond. Today's webinar will have a very specific focus on the economic and political outlook, trends and challenges for the Asia Pacific region, all set within um, the context of a, a broader global picture. Today's session will be very interactive. We'll have two Q&A sessions, um, one in the middle and then another one, a second one at the end of the presentation. So thank you to everyone who's pre-submitted questions. Um, for those of you that haven't, or for or, or, or questions come to mind as we move through the presentation, um, as Simone was saying, please use the chat function, which is found on the, the, the right hand side of your screen usually, um, and, and enter your questions um, and address them to all panelists. Um, so um, in that way, um, only the panelists um, then, um, then, then see your questions. Um, so please do submit them um, because uh, I'm sure this is going to be very um, thought provoking. Um, so with that, I'm delighted to introduce to you our speaker for today, Tom Rafferty, who's the Regional Director for Asia at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Tom is an expert on politics and economics in Asia with specific interests in regional geopolitics, public policy and China's political economy. He's a regular commentator in the international media um, and, uh, and a published author. So with that, Tom, over to you. Thank you, Julie, for the warm welcome and good morning or good afternoon to everybody who's listening today. Um, great to have the opportunity to talk with you all at such an um, interesting and perhaps turbulent time for uh, the regional economy here in, in Asia Pacific. Um, I'm personally based in, in Beijing in China. Um, and also for the global economy. Still a lot of uncertainty out there. Uh, today I'm going to be talking um, about some broad themes which are shaping our views and forecasts um, about the about Asia Pacific in 2021 and also looking a little bit beyond that, um, maybe perhaps not in a post-COVID environment, but it's certainly in an environment where we become uh, more accustomed to living with COVID. Um, I want to begin with sort of taking a fairly big picture perspective um, and looking at some Four big questions that we at the EIU are thinking about as we think about um, our forecast for 2021. You could see these as things that, um, as forecasters, are keeping us up at night, which, if it doesn't sound too nerdy, because these, some of these issues are quite technical. But four big questions that are shaping our forecast at the moment. Uh, first one is around vaccines, of course. Um, how quickly um, can we get vaccines rolled out across the world um, so that we are all in a much safer position? and in a better position to normalize economic activity. Second big one, um, and I think it's particularly relevant for those of us here in Asia Pacific, is how the US-China relationship is going to develop and evolve, and what will be the impact on, on business in the region, given the importance of Asia to um, supply, global supply chains in particular. Two other key, key questions for economics, I think, um, as we chart the way forward, and our consequences of um, the way we have responded to the pandemic are is around the one is around the question of debt. Um, obviously, governments um, and households have seen debts rise quite sharply during the pandemic. How are we going to manage this extra debt load 
in the years ahead, how are governments going to manage it without compromising their credibility. And the second one we're looking at, and it's particularly timely at the moment, is the issue of inflation. How strong is the inflation surge that we're seeing at the moment, and how long will it last for? Could this undercut the economic recovery that has begun um, in key parts of the global economy? So these are four questions that we're looking at quite closely at the moment, and we'll come on to each of these things in a bit more detail uh, during the presentation. The first section I want to talk about is the um, sharing some of the IU's views about the global um, and regional outlook for economic growth. Now we began, I think overall this year is um, uh, in, we're in a better position than we were last year, certainly. Um, and we began this year, of course, with a lot of optimism, um, given the extraordinary progress we saw in terms of vaccine development and the initial um, rollout of vaccines. I think some of that optimism has dissipated um, a little bit in recent months, especially in Asia, given uh, the emergence, um, uh, re-emergence and resurgence of, of COVID um, and some difficulties in terms of vaccine rollout. But overall, in terms of economic performance this year, it should be a much better year than the very difficult one uh, we all experienced last year. Last year, we saw a deep global recession. Global GDP fell by almost 4% last year. This year, we're going to see a bounce back from that very low base levels. So in the slide here, you can see some key forecasts for key economies um, uh, around the globe. Um, I think the key ones to forecast in terms of influencing overall global growth, of course, is the very strong um, um, growth we're expecting in the United States this year, uh, driven by relatively quick vaccine rollout and normalization of economic activity there, but also, of course, a very significant stimulus that the Biden administration has introduced since it came into office. That is going to have a very strong stimulative impact on US economy this year. The pace of recovery in, in Europe and the EU is a bit more milder in, in contrast. Vaccine roll has been a bit slower there on average, and the level of stimulus has also been a bit more moderate. And I think the other key segment for the global economy, of course, is um, the Chinese economy, second largest in the world. And we're expecting quite strong growth in China this year. It was one of the few major economies, of course, to grow last year uh, by around 2%, uh, weak by China standards, but not bad in the context of a global pandemic. This year, growth should pick up um, even further to around 8.5%. So quite differing um, economic forecasts across the globe. And I think one interesting thing is that the recovery in developed markets um, this year um, is looking stronger in general than that in developing markets. So if we look at our growth forecasts for uh, the Middle East and North Africa region, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, and to some extent Latin America, you can see that the growth rates we're expecting there are, are weaker than that we're seeing in, in the US and Europe, for example. And I think a lot of that pivots on uh, vaccine uh, rollout and delivery and uh, the inequity we're seeing in that in terms of supply and provision at the moment. So overall, we're expecting around 5% growth in GDP this year. So um, recouping some of that activity that we lost in 2020. So in terms of just looking a little bit more detail at um, uh, the G20 economies in particular, um, and of course, 5% growth overall sounds quite um, a bullish number um, as a headline number, but it's a little, also a little bit misleading uh, because of the very low base that we had from last year. So this is growth on the back of, uh, um, of a global recession, essentially. So in some ways, it's more helpful to think about when economies will be back to their levels of pre-pandemic GDP. So the levels that they were at in, in the last quarter of 2019 before the pandemic arrived. And here on the slide here, you can see exactly when we think different economies, and I'm testing your knowledge of uh, national flags here a little bit, um, exactly when we think uh, different economies uh, among the G20 will be back to their 29 levels of GDP. And you can see that for the process of recovery is actually a little bit more stretched than might be suggested by that strong headline growth uh, that I mentioned earlier. So some economies, China, Turkey, um, and now South Korea are already back to the levels of GDP um, in 2019. Uh, their, their economies have um, recovered um, um, and are now growing beyond uh, where they were before the pandemic. Um, and for most, uh, several other major G20 economies, they will also pass that threshold this year, um, including the United States um, and India as well. Uh, but for many, uh, for the majority, it's going to be more of a, a recovery in 2022 and for some, even stretching into 2023 and 24, as you can see there um, on, on, on the slide. So I think the key point there is, yes, we're going to get some good, healthy growth numbers this year, but this recovery is still an ongoing one for many parts of the world. 
and uh, in many countries um, it will be a very stretched process um, with a great deal of uncertainty. Um, but overall, I think uh, certainly the recovery is looking a little bit quicker than perhaps we were thinking um, six months or so um, or ago. I want to turn a little bit more to um, Asia Pacific, given that's the focus of our conversation today. And as I mentioned before, I got the optimism that uh, we had in the region at the beginning of this year has um, dissipated um, a little bit because of the emergence, re-emergence of COVID um, in a series of very powerful ways that are hitting different parts of the region in different ways. Um, the most obvious case of that has been um, India, um, but currently at the moment uh, we are seeing waves peaking in across Southeast Asia as well. A couple of factors driving this, and I think it's also interesting to note that for 2020, of course, the pandemic, uh, Asia was the least affected region by the pandemic. Um, case levels and fat fatalities across Asia were in, in general much lower than elsewhere in the world. Um, governments were able to, were more willing to respond quite uh, uh, in quite tight ways to the pandemic, early border closures and so on, and they, that helped to limit the impact of COVID in 2020. Uh, but in 2021, um, certainly I think there are signs that some economies, some countries have been caught a little bit on the back foot in terms of dealing with COVID. Now, some of that's uncontrollable. Um, we know that the Delta variant of emerged in India is much more infectious, for example. So dealing with that has just been, has been more challenging. But I think there's a, in some cases also a certain degree of complacency on the behalf of governments. Um, perhaps a sense that because things um, were generally not too awful in 2020, that would, that, that would continue to be the case this year. Of course, it hasn't been, um, and we know from the nature of this, this virus that that is likely to be the case. So a degree of complacency in terms of, for example, accelerating and starting mass vaccination drives, there's no doubt that Asia has been a little bit behind the curve there. So in India, um, we had a huge second wave in sort of the April-May period, um, which peaked at around 400,000 cases daily. Um, and that was probably a significant underestimation of uh, the actual number of cases and um, very devastating consequences, of course, for public health and the loss of life there. Thankfully, that peak is, is behind us, but um, clearly there's, there is a risk of another wave coming in India later this year. Now, at the moment, as you can see by on, on the slide here, um, several countries in Southeast Asia most notably Indonesia, which is the most populous country in the region, are dealing with very significant third waves after not really experiencing major outbreaks um, in 2020. So in some ways, it's the first time they're dealing with uh, the pandemic of this scale, and it's stretching healthcare um, uh, resources and facilities in the region to their limits at the moment. So quite a worrying situation. So the key to managing um, COVID, of course, um, is, um, of course, good public health management. The key to moving beyond it, or at least to living with it, is going to be vaccination. And as I mentioned, the process of vaccination in Asia has been somewhat slow um, and a bit more um, slower paced than elsewhere. So we've at the AU, um, given this is such a key aspect of our economic forecasting in terms of economic normalization, we spend quite a lot of time trying to understand uh, the process and progress of vaccine rollout in the region. Um, and we have quite detailed timelines for when we expect uh, different countries to have exceeded um, a threshold which is almost akin to herd immunity. Uh, so we're saying that's a vaccination of 60%, fully vaccination of 60% of the, of the population. And you can see here on the slide some of our expectations for when this will be achieved in the region. And you can see there's quite different, different, a large scale, um, it's a large scale variation of that um, um, across the region. We are expecting some key economies to have achieved mass vaccination this year. Uh, China perhaps being the most notable one, as you can see there on the left hand side, alongside several smaller, um, less populous countries, which have been able to secure um, uh, decent vaccine access. So Mongolia, Maldives and Bhutan. Elsewhere in the region, it's going to be a more stretched one. Um, I think surprisingly, um, some of the region's most advanced economies um, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand um, are relatively slow um, on vaccine rollout. Um, and we're not expecting them to cross the threshold for uh, mass vaccination until uh, early 2022. Um, and then you can see for developing emerging Asia, the process is going to be much more quite stretched in our opinion. Some countries stretching into 2023, 
2024 or even beyond. So there's still a long way uh, to go here. And I think the, the relatively slow pace of vaccination in Asia reflects a couple of factors. One has been on the demand side, um, so that quite high degree of vaccine hesitancy um, in some key um, countries, especially when uh, there wasn't really a sense that dealing with the pandemic was uh, such a urgent matter um, given 2020. And the other issue, um, and this is a global issue, of course, has been on the supply side. Um, Asia in particular has been affected um, by reliance on India as a, as a vaccine production center. And with India sort of focusing its production um, on dealing with the domestic pandemic uh, this year, that has meant there's basically been a, a, um, an effective stop on exports from, of vaccines from India. So finding new sources of supply for the vaccine um, has been a challenge and that's something that governments in the region are still working through at the moment. Um, so the, there's a lot to go here and as vaccination will be relatively slow, um, the region is going to remain vulnerable um, to on-off lockdown measures and social restriction measures. On the issue, um, I mentioned there just the uh, the fact that restriction measures um, and lockdown policies are going to remain with us um, given that vaccine uh, timeline, um, certainly for the rest of this year, and um, um, I suspect deep into 2022, um, it's important to understand what they're going to look like. And um, I think a key difference, of course, is that governments uh, have become more accustomed to managing these issues. And while they are going to still rely on lockdown policies to, to deal with the pandemic, they're going to be uh, more sophisticated um, in how these measures are implemented. Um, more discreet and more focused on ensuring that the impact of lockdown measures is as localized and as limited as possible um, within within uh, the confines of managing the public health situation as best they can. So on this side, for example, um, I've included some um, information which helps sort of grasp the type of lockdown policies that India implemented during its second wave in April, May. And you can see by in terms of their impact on um, either mobility, um, in retail, in the retail or recreation sectors, or in the workplace sector, the impact has been lesser uh, than we saw compared with the, with the very stringent lockdown policies implemented in India in early, in the same period of 2020, actually. So in terms of their economic impact, um, the uh, lockdown policies uh, this year and into next year um, will be uh, softer. And that is one reason why we're still expecting to see um, economic growth um, in Asia this year and, and next year. So lockdown policies are back, but they are going to be implemented in, in a different and more sophisticated way. The other key aspect, I think, um, at the moment, um, and it's kind of a counterpoint to softer lockdown policies, is that the level of policy support that governments um, have available um, to support their economies, support households and companies, um, as we still go through a period of one-off lockdowns in this year and into next year, is less, right? Um, just because the level of support was so uh, substantial last year, either in terms of lowering interest rates um, to lower costs of, of financing and ease repayment strains, or, or fiscal support in terms of direct support for households and companies to keep them afloat. Um, the support was so significant uh, last year, there just is less space this year. So while lockdown policies will be one hand softer, the economic impact more modest, on the other hand, there is going to be less um, stimulus, we suspect, offered by governments across the region. Um, and that will um, counterbalance, um, to some extent, the lockdown policies as well. I think especially on the fiscal side, governments have racked up an awful lot of debt as a result of the pandemic. And especially for emerging Asian countries, um, they um, are going to face credibility issues in, in the face of investors and buyers of their debt if they are not seen if they are seen as being too fiscally expansive in their policies so we're not expecting large-scale policy support um, in the next 12 months or so so putting all that together in terms of our key growth forecast for key asian economies um, in 2021 you see here on the chart i've benchmarked um, our current forecasts our latest forecast as of june um, against the um, gdp performance in 2020 and against what we were forecasting for 2021 um, back uh, six months ago in January. And you can see the scale of changes um, that we've been making over the last six months at the ERU as we adjust our expectations 
to the pandemic and uh, the data that we're seeing come out of economies at the moment. I think the general story there is that for Asia's exporters, uh, so those countries which are heavily reliant on exports to drive their economies, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, to some extent Bangladesh are good examples of this. These economies are thriving in the context of um, strong global demand for items such as consumer electronics, for example. So in general, those economies are outperforming in the region, um, helped by revival in global economy, um, strong growth in the United States and, and Europe. The outlook for more um, domestic demand focused um, economies, so those reliant on household spending and business investment is a little bit less positive um, because of the challenges around managing on off pandemic issues and some of the, the lack of policy space that have this year. So that's going to affect growth in some um, key economies, but there are some pockets of um, Asia, I think, especially looking at China, Australia, New Zealand, which are examples of um, economies which have managed the pandemic quite well and have been able to restart their domestic economies um, relatively successfully. In terms of the worst performers in Asia, um, it's going to be, I think, it's still, um, it's going to, going to be remain a story of those which are heavily reliant on services activity and particularly tourism, um, given the, the big challenges in restarting international tourism. So the likes of Thailand, um, Indonesia, Philippines, for examples of economies which are services and tourism oriented and are going to struggle um, to restart their economies in a very strong way this year. That way, their recovery is going to be more of a 2022, 23 story, uh, we believe. Okay, so um, we'll be coming up to a Q&A session hopefully soon. But before then, I wanted to tackle sort of a, a couple of key policy challenges and risks outside of the growth outlook um, for the region in particular um, over the next 12 months or so. One of the key ones, and I think this is a global concern, of course, is the issue of inflation. Um, we are seeing strong price pressures um, uh, running through the global economy at the moment because of a variety of factors. Uh, certainly the reopening of the US and European economies has given a big lift to commodity prices, so the price of fuel, um, food, and so on. Um, that will have an impact across Asia um, as global prices um, increase. We're also seeing some other supply side issues, such as around um, ease of doing international trade and shipment, um, lack of uh, capacity on key shipping routes, for example. That's increasing the cost of shipping, and that will in turn probably be passed on to consumers um, through higher goods costs. So this is a significant risk um, to take account of. And of course, we know the impact of high inflation can have on economies, it can undercut, undercut household spending. They can also force central banks to increase interest rates at a faster pace than perhaps might, we might have expected beforehand. So this is, and that will in turn impact on economic activity. So this is a key issue um, for the global economy at the moment. As you can see by the forecast we have on, on the slide deck showed here, we actually at the IU have a fairly benign view about uh, the inflation dynamics. So we're cutting a little bit against the view that this is going to be a significant issue for the Asian and global economies, at least in um, most regions, with perhaps the exception of the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Inflation is going to tick up this year, but it's still going to be remain relatively moderate compared to historic levels. Um, in Asia in particular, while we do have some pressures coming through on the supply side, which I've just talked about, on the demand side, especially in terms of consumer demand, there are, there are sources of weakness there which are probably going to offset price pressures in other ways. So, um, the fact that um, unemployment levels uh, and income levels have been affected by the pandemic means that households do have um, weaker demand and that's going to have a, a pull down effect on prices. In addition, I think food price trends, which are key factors shaping inflation in, across Asia, especially some big markets like China, India, um, we are actually seeing disinflationary trends in food prices at the moment. So for those reasons, um, we do not think uh, governments, central banks in Asia, are going to come under significant pressure this year to increase interest rates. That should be a positive thing for the economic recovery um, at a time when we, we really do need um, loose monetary policy to continue to support the recovery. The other issue I think which governments are beginning to think about and, and tackle is um, sort of the risk that we've seen um, increasing on the financial side. So a consequence of, of course, that very loose accommodative monetary liquidity policy setting has been that there's been an awful lot of money flowing through economies. And a lot of money has ended up in property markets um, and in stock markets in the region. 
Uh, the effect of this, um, of course, has positive wealth effects in some ways, but also increases um, income inequality and social inequality. Those who are benefiting from rising house prices or rising stock prices are, of course, those who are exposure to those assets, which are typically middle, part, middle income, uh, upper middle income and upper income segments of, of demographics. So as a result of this trend, um, um, issues around inequality, potentially even social stability are going to be um, increasing. Um, South Korea is a very good example of this, a relatively rapid recovery from the pandemic. House prices in South Korea, particularly Seoul, have been skyrocketing as a result um, of uh, the additional liquidity available in the economy. And that is really causing a lot of concern for the government around how to manage this issue going forwards. So how are governments across the region going to deal with this um, issue of rising inequality? I think we're looking realistically at higher taxes eventually on forms of wealth and income, um, as well as um, higher taxes on some segments, segments, some segments of the corporate sector, particularly, for example, the digital economy, which is relatively underregulated at the moment. We will probably see affordability drives in housing across the region. And other efforts, perhaps, to um, tape, taper the uh, the interests of um, large corporates, particularly in the technology space, which are relatively unregulated, and we're seeing a lot of that in China, for example, at the moment. The risk, of course, here is, as I mentioned before, if governments move too rapidly on tightening to try and tackle this issue um, of excess liquidity in economies, that would cause issues with the with the economic recovery. So we're expecting, and we hope, there will be a careful balance struck between these two goals. One of the key issues that we're looking at, of course, is the issue of border reopening, or rather the lack of border reopening. And I know that will be a concern for many of you listening in today. Um, I think that's particularly the case because the, the form of pandemic management in Asia, particularly some key a Asian economies, for example, China, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Vietnam, um, Singapore, perhaps to some extent as well, um, they have adopted what has been called a zero COVID policy, which is essentially a strategy aimed at eliminating the virus um, within national borders rather than learning to live with it. It's quite a different approach that's been taken in, in Europe and North America, for example. And in terms of public health, the impact of this has been, of course, very positive, and that's very obvious by the data that I'm showing there on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, much lower cases of COVID and, and fatalities as well. Economically, also, it's been quite positive. Um, it has allowed many of these economies, um, with the absence of COVID, to reopen retail um, and recreational services at a much earlier date um, than those elsewhere in the world. But I think our concern is how, um, how, how, long, how sustainable is that policy in the long term, especially as vaccination enables um, the global economy, other parts of the global economy to reopen um, to a much greater degree, uh, particularly the United States and Europe. Um, so you, I think there is a risk there that adhering to a zero COVID policy is going to be undercutting economic activity going forwards, um, a missed economic opportunity by adhering to that policy rather than trying to embrace uh, a reopening of the global economy. I think also in Asia, some very specific issues for Asia's business hubs like Hong Kong, Singapore, about how they deal um, with uh, their, given their reliance on business travel, flows of capital and people um, in and out of, the, of their territory, how they deal with that um, at a time of also managing COVID at a very low level. It's going to be very challenging, um, but I think that probably the conclusion that we have is that the process of border reopening in Asia is going to be much more slow and lagged than elsewhere in the world, um, but we'll probably eventually have to come and we're expecting some movement there uh, probably in 2022, uh, not this year. Um, on China, and obviously China is an important um, source for tourism and students, of course, globally. Um, we think China will be the most conservative of any country in the region in terms of border reopening. And that will have, of course, have implications for how soon Chinese tourists go back to market, Chinese students go back to education. And that's highlighted there by the, the graphic there on the right hand side. We're not expecting Chinese outbound tourism to recover to pre-COVID levels until 2024. And even then, it's going to stay way below the potential um, that we would have expected pre-COVID if we hadn't, if we, if we hadn't um, experienced a pandemic. So it has a really had a quite a big impact on some key drivers for the regional economy there. Put a couple of slides before we all break the Q&A. Um, and I wanted to just turn to some political issues, um, given uh, 
the importance of this in shaping policy outcomes across the region. Um, it's clear that governments are being held accountable um, uh, increasingly on their pandemic management. And given that um, that has deteriorated so far in Asia this year, I think this is going to be a, an increasing concern of um, demographics and electorates um, across the region. Um, the Indian example is quite an interesting one to look at. Um, at the moment, um, certainly uh, Prime Minister Modi has always been a very popular leader in India. He has had the, of any global leader, he's always had the highest net approval ratings. Uh, but even um, Prime Minister um, Modi has seen his approval ratings uh, diminish as a result of the very uh, the devastating second wave in India. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how politicians like him, who are known for being quite populist in their stance, adjust to the expectations of their electorates. Um, India, for example, um, has just implemented a quite a large scale cabinet reshuffle, and that's seen the elevation of uh, more technocratic figures in the Modi government, including the replacement of the health minister, for example, with a more technocratic figure. Um, so that's an interesting sign that uh, governments uh, in the region are making some shifts in their approach and that they recognize the desire for technocratic competence may be outweighing some populist inclinations um, so far. I think also be aware of the electoral calendar for Asia. We know that elections can be disruptive um, for business management, business planning um, and policy expectations. And there are several key ones coming up in Asia over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, already this year, we've seen transitions in Vietnam and Laos. Uh, later this year, uh, we are probably going to, we are going to see um, local elections in Hong Kong, probably a snap election in Malaysia, and a, a major national election in Japan um, in September or October, most probably. Looking further ahead, um, Australian elections next year, and also in Korea for Korea's presidents. And then final one I've, I've flagged there at the end of that cycle is Perhaps the most crucial one actually in the region is the leadership transition in China in autumn 2022. That will determine um, what um, what powers uh, President Xi will retain and what his ambitions for his uh, further terms in, in office will look like. Um, so he'll be extending his decade in power at that meeting, and that will be very crucial for shaping geopolitics in the region and, and the outlook for China as well. Okay, and then on that issue, of course, is the issue of the US-China relationship, which is crucial for the region. Um, and we are now several months into a new administration in the United States. And I think the main message um, that we're getting there is that there's a lot of continuity uh, in US policy towards China, which means um, that the relationship will, mean, will remain very difficult and strained um, overall. Um, certainly, there have been some more um, opportunities open for engagement um, between China and the United States. There has been a restart of conversation around in areas such as climate change um, and health security, for example. Um, perhaps a less intense focus as well by the Biden administration on um, the trade war, the tariff war um, aspects that we saw under the Trump administration from 2018. But certainly the underlying economic tensions and perhaps even more intense geopolitical and political tensions between the United States and China are very obvious um, under the Biden administration as well. So key issues around geopolitics in, in, in Asia, status of Taiwan, um, status of the South China Sea, as well as under underlying concerns around economic policy in China, issues like IPR tech transfer and so on. And I think on China's side as well, there's been there was always a long recognition um, that U.S. policy was unlikely to have changed substantially under Biden. And China, I think, is prepared and preparing for the fact that the U.S.-China relationship will become more difficult, not easier, um, in the years ahead. Okay. Um, with that, I would um, like to um, pass back to Julie so we can um, open up the first Q and A session. Thank you, um, Tom. So <clears throat> please um, do um, submit your questions um, via the chat to all panelists. Um, but we have a couple coming in. So um, I, I'd like to, to start with and ask Tom, you know, crises present opportunities too. So um, two angles to this question. The first one is which economies in developing Asia will emerge strongest from this period and why? Um, and then drilling down into that, 
do you think some industries will come out of the um, pandemic stronger and where do you expect jobs to be focused? So sort of three angles um, on the same uh, uh, recovery question there. Yeah, I think, yeah, obviously crisis in some ways do present opportunities and uh, the key, and we'll be coming back to this in, in the remainder of the presentation is how um, um, how Asian economies build back better, if you like, in the years yeah. ahead. Do they embrace uh, sustainability, um, tackle issues like we've been talking about around uh, social inequality, for example, or, or do they not? Um, I think in general, um, which countries are going to do better in the near term? It's going to be closely tied to success in pandemic management and vaccine rollout. And I shared some of our expectations there for, for timelines. I think in general, if we look across the region, uh, the story has been that the countries that are performing best um, include the likes of uh, within developed economies, include the likes of Korea, Taiwan. If I was going to right. predict some emerging economies that are doing particularly well at the moment in a very challenging circumstance, I think in South Asia, Bangladesh is quite an interesting example of an economy that has been able to limit the impact of um, the pandemic through quite effective health, public health management, um, and has been able to keep its economy um, functioning and actually growing at a relatively fast pace during the pandemic. So actually Bangladesh is one of our fastest growing economies for 2020-21, uh, partly because of that. Clearly, there's still a lot of challenges there, um, but um, uh, there are examples of that where a combination of good healthcare management um, and export reliance, strong industrial sectors have been able to help economies. And, and Bangladesh, is, I think, is an interesting example. Uh, within Southeast Asia, it's a bit challenging given the situation at the moment, which is hitting all parts of the region quite hard. But um, I think we're still relatively confident, say, on the long-term outlook for economies such as Malaysia and Thailand, for example, and their ability to see through this crisis um, and keep their economies uh, developing and growing in the years ahead. Um, for, for industries, um, I think the, the themes there are pretty consistent and um, across the globe, actually. Um, and clearly, we're seeing accelerated transitions in areas like digital and, and technology sectors. And uh, in Asia, I think already that segment, that sector was already quite advanced. Um, certainly, if you look at, I think, China and Southeast Asia as examples of where e-commerce, for example, was already deeply penetrated into uh, consumers' lifestyles and habits. Um, clearly, that this trend that has positioned them well to keep this transition and accelerate this transition uh, going forward. So that's clearly going to be interesting examples of some key sectors uh, that we think will do quite well out of this. And I think in general, um, the industrial sectors in, in Asia ought to perform quite well as long as, as long as economies can keep progressing and moving up the value chain. Okay, thank you. We've, we've got a lot of questions coming in on the chat at the moment. So, um, uh, you, you obviously focused a fair amount on on vaccine as part of living um, with uh, with COVID long term. And uh, a question here was, do you believe the so-called vaccine vaccine diplomacy of China has the power to challenge or change the political landscape in Asian countries like Taiwan and the Philippines, for example? Um. I think the evidence so far is is quite mixed on on that one. Um, vaccine China has been quite um, quite early in terms of exporting vaccines um, and getting supply to parts of the region when other supply was not available. Um, so that's been a success story, I think, for for China to share. Um, I think the issues that um, we're dealing with in terms of Chinese vaccines at the moment are their levels of efficacy. Um, so particularly the, the Sinovac vaccine, which is the one that China has preferred to export, um, the efficacy of that is is quite low relative to other vaccines. And mm. it doesn't seem super effective against the Delta variant, which is predominant at the moment. So right. some countries which have taken large quantities of Sinovac, Mongolia, um, for example, are also dealing with quite serious outbreaks at the moment. Um, so there's a, there's a risk. I think China did a very good job early on in terms of getting out supply at a time when it wasn't available. Um, but now there perhaps will be some question marks raised over the efficacy. So it'd be interesting to see how it responds. Um, so I would say it kind of cuts both ways. Um, and at the moment, it's not quite clear which direction it's going to go. Um, mm. But certainly, in terms of ability early on to provide some level of protection um, in Asia was was welcome, was welcome most, largely in the region. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. And, and building on your question, you know, you talked somewhat about um, uh, Chinese tourism, you know, uh, it, it, the the impact in in the region and uh, and elsewhere. And uh, a couple of questions have come in focused around students. So, what will the impact of COVID have on countries that rely on international students? Do you see a situation where students from China no longer look to Australia, Europe, and the USA for study? Um, so there are several questions that have come in, not surprisingly, from this audience around that theme. Yeah, um, I think the underlying demand there for uh, within China for overseas education is still there. It's still resilient, and uh, we are still seeing, for example, at the moment, Chinese students preparing to start their studies in the United States and uh, and Europe this this autumn. Um, so countries which have been able to um, keep um, the student uh, sort of uh, keep themselves open to incoming students um, and manage the process there effectively, do stand out to benefit from that underlying demand. I think clearly we're going to see a dip, though, um, in the coming years as we deal with the pandemic. Um, concerns about um, health safety in other countries um, will be prominent for some Chinese students and families, I would imagine. Um, and they'll, um, I think, in general, some of the geopolitical tensions this is pre-COVID, Maybe influencing some university and education choices um, made by them. So yeah. I would say it's resilient demand. Um, we're going to have a dip in the next couple of years, um, but we should get back to growth eventually. Um, but I do think, in long term, if we're going to stretch out five, ten years, um, Chinese student demand, the demand growth on the China side though, is probably less than what we've been accustomed to. And I right. think there will be uh, the popularity of domestic choices. Um, um, will also increase to some extent too. So I think for, uh, for other countries in the region, the issue of diversifying um, student international student flows will, will become quite a prominent one in the years ahead. Right. So Tom, we, we, we have a lot of questions um, here at the moment, but I think we should carry on. Thank you for submitting your questions. Please keep them coming because we're going to have another session at the end. So Tom, back to you. OK, thanks, Julie. Um, I realize we've got about 20 minutes, so I'm going to race through my remaining slides so we can have some time for questions at the end. Um, in the remainder of the presentation, I just wanted to talk really about getting a bit beyond COVID and thinking what are going to be the themes shaping Asia in the medium to long term. And again, thinking about this idea of building back better. How do we, how is the regional economy going to be shaping up in the years ahead? Um, one key issue in, in this context I think, is the issue of supply chains. Um, Asia is central to global manufacturing supply chains absolutely crucial to them. Um, and there's obviously been a lot of discussion about how these are going to be changing in the years ahead, partly because of the trade war, the pandemic, and, and so on. Um, I would say on this, our view is that basically um, China is still going to remain very central to the manufacturing supply chain in the region. Um, it still has significant advantages as, as a manufacturing location, despite geopolitical uncertainty. Um, and you can see in China's latest development plan, its five-year plan, a very strong focus on the manufacturing sector there. So I think for China, there's a desire to keep manufacturing within its borders as best it can. Still, because of cost pressures and perhaps some other issues, we, are, we will see some diversification of supply chains in the region. And certainly um, Southeast Asia um, could potentially stand to benefit most from this. Vietnam has already been perhaps the prime beneficiary from the US-China trade war. It's been able to attract a lot of manufacturing investment in recent years. Other countries in, in that part of the world, Indonesia, for example, could also stand to benefit if they can make certain reforms to um, and um, investments in infrastructure to make manufacturing um, in their country attractive. So we think supply chain diversification, diversification will occur in Asia, but China is still probably going to remain the linchpin of the regional supply chain. And the idea of a, of a decoupling um, from the Chinese economy is, is very unlikely in our, in our view. On a similar theme, uh, the issue of the trade agenda in Asia and how that's developing at the moment. And I would say here we've got very contradictory signals. On one hand, we're seeing some good progress in terms of moving through free trade agreements. So the RCEP agreement, which spans um, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and Australia and New Zealand, um, ought to become effective at the beginning of, of next year. That will have a very positive, not sort of a huge game-changing impact on, on, on trade in the region, but will help to um, bring about greater consistency and regulation between uh, very different economies in the region. 
and the CPTPP as well, which um, has been effective for a couple of years now, um, is still progressing and, and having an impact and will probably be expanding in the years ahead with potential UK participation, perhaps even Chinese participation uh, down the line. So quite positive there. On the other hand, I think with the pandemic, obviously governments have become much more sensitive to around sort of retaining areas of strategic control within their economies, particularly over um, critical medical production, uh, vaccine supply and so on. Um, so that agenda, that self-sufficiency agenda um, is also rubbing alongside trade liberalization. And probably China is a classic example of this happening. So China has been a very big supporter of RCEP, but China is also very aggressively pursuing self-sufficiency in technology in particular, in areas like semiconductors, which is highlighted here on the screen. China is very heavily dependent on foreign supply um, for semiconductor provision, which is obviously key for the whole technology supply chain. Um, and it's concerned about the security of that supply given US-China relationship and the importance of US technology in semiconductors. So China is looking to reduce its reliance in some critical areas going forward, and that's going to have a big macro impact on countries which are currently reliant on shipping to shipping such goods to China, Taiwan, South Korea, and Malaysia being some key examples. Um, on a point which I think perhaps would be relevant for the audience here, um, given the education sector is um, sort of the outlook for, for jobs and employment in the years ahead. Obviously, we're going through uh, a period of difficulty at the moment. Um, and I think there are some factors which we really, um, supportive, I would say, of um, especially graduate education demand in the years ahead as we go through this process of um, quite stretched recovery. But certainly the appetite for, I think, public sector and private sector employers um, to be increasing hiring, uh, particularly in entry level jobs in the years ahead will be quite challenging as they try to manage uh, uh, their balance sheets and try and pay down some of the debt that they've accumulated during this crisis. So from that perspective, um, so for the economy overall, it's not that positive, but I think at least for education demand, it's positive because it means I think more undergraduates will be looking to opportunities to upskill, um, to enter into graduate education. Um, so they become more competitive in, in, in potentially quite a difficult jobs marketplace in the, in the years ahead. On the climate change, um, the agenda here is obviously moving forward very quickly and has been helped by uh, renewed US leadership on, on the issue under the Biden administration. Um, I think in Asia, um, we are seeing um, quite significant progress. Japan, South Korea, China have all come out with zero carbon um, emissions targets um, or carbon neutrality targets um, for either 2050 or 2060 over the last 12 months. And we're seeing a little bit more ambition uh, even within sort of emerging and frontier Asian economies. Uh, there still is a long way to go. Asia is still very heavily dependent on fossil fuels and that energy transition is going to take many years. But if you look at some of our forecasts for say when peak carbon emissions will help will, help, will occur, we do see some significant progress in the 2020s. China we see peaking carbon emissions in 2025, Australia um, potentially this year, South Korea 2026 and so on. But other parts of the region, there's still a lot of um, a lot of work that needs doing. If you're looking at India, Indonesia, Vietnam, ultimately, though, um, of course, it's um, the issue of global warming, which is going to drive progress here. But there's also quite a lot of economic self-interest for China. Uh, the strong economic self-interest in developing stronger renewables capacity and being a global leader in that sector. Um, and I think for emerging Asian economies, Indonesia is a good example. Its economy will come under pressure from global climate change policies, given it's say dependence on shipping palm oil, for example. So it's going to come under pressure to um, reinvent and uh, transition its economy because of the policy drive there. So a lot of economic self-interest will undergird Asian, Asian progress on this issue in the years ahead. So just <clears throat> wrapping up with some thoughts on the long term for Asia. Um, I think the story for um, emerging markets um, in general, um, is still a fairly strong one and of course that's relevant for I think for education sector as well. There's still going to be an overhang issue from this crisis in terms of managing debt in the years ahead which is going to trim economic growth perhaps in the medium long term against historic levels so we've I've included some estimates there for uh, different key emerging markets around the world there um, and clearly uh, we are expecting growth to moderate versus those early years. 
but still fundamentally there still ought to be strong quite strong growth in the middle class segments across the world um, in the years ahead uh, even if it's not quite as spectacular as what we saw in the pre-COVID era. In the long term Asia's economic importance will rise um, our projections are for China's economy to exceed US GDP in the early 2030s um, so not quite by 2030 but probably soon after and if we're looking at where the additional GDP in the world economy is going to be coming from in the next decade or so it is mainly in Asia so not just China actually if you look at the chart here for example India makes quite strong strides in terms of its GDP despite the pandemic um, over over a long given a long-term horizon we see um, South Korea emerging quite strongly there as a top 10 global economy as well um, in the period of 2030 um, so a lot of the extra GDP um, and output and, and productivity growth in the years ahead will be from Asia we think the main risk in our view though um, is this issue of geopolitics and how Asia manages the huge changes in the balance of power distribution of economic weight in the region in the years ahead especially given um, quite significant territorial disputes between uh, different uh, economies and, and countries in the region whether that's East China Sea South China Sea China India border all sorts of issues there to be sorted out in the years ahead and I think the very dramatic shifts we're seeing in the balance of power and the lack of regional forums to manage that competition is is a concern so there are certainly aspects of Asian power rival at the moment which do um, uh, bear resemblance to what we saw um, in the late 19th century for example in Europe so a lot of issues to be sorted out there in the years ahead and I've included some of the yeah use key geopolitical risks um, for the region to keep an eye on in, in the years ahead I will finish there uh, on the side in terms of two a few um, key trends to watch out for 2021 We've covered a lot of this territory in the presentation so far, but useful to recap. Um, inequalities um, in terms of economic recovery, um, a lot of it tied to um, vaccine rollout. Um, tech segregation, how that will um, impact the global economy and particularly the US China relationship, given strong competition in that areas. How countries are going to think about rebuilding. We're seeing positive signals in terms of areas like climate change, for example, um, in Asia. Will that be sustainable um, and will it keep building? And how do we deal with some of the political changes that are going to be coming through under a US administration, under China, under a given extended period in power for President Xi, and given that electoral timeline for Asia as well um, in the next 12 months or so. So thank you very much for, for listening. And um, I think we've still got time, I hope, for a few questions at the end. So I'll pass back to Julie. Thank you, Tom. So yes, let, let's dive into questions because we've got a lot of questions come in and we'll, we'll just get to a few of them now. So, um, one of the questions, and, and you touched on this in terms of the sort of drive towards sort of clean energy um, that's going on globally, but um, one of the questions that is sustainability is a big concern of the region and it, it has had some positive results in recent years. However, um, COVID might sweep away those efforts. Do you see any lights of commitment that Asian countries continue to chase for sustainable development? Overall, it's quite, been quite positive. I mean, obviously, when we've been dealing with an economic recession, like we've been dealing with the temptation, I think, for the policymakers will be just looking to try to revive economies through whatever means possible. So, you know, tapping back to reliance on um, certain types of very energy intensive industrial activity, for example. I think that would have been a temptation, but I think the evidence so far has been quite positive. Um, governments have, have seen an opportunity to try and build, use, for example, the fiscal support they've been providing through the pandemic to focus on areas of green infrastructure, for example. So right. providing, so providing more investment and support for renewables, um, investment in critical digital infrastructure and so on all geared around sort of sustainability issues and as I said a lot of countries have come up with quite specific uh, carbon neutrality targets during this very difficult period so I think um, I'd actually be a bit more optimistic um, about the direction of travel there and I think still think overall Asia is lagging sort of the conversation in other parts of the world but I'm seeing quite positive changes in the last 12 months or so. Excellent thank you well that 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 is that is positive 
Um, and changing track um, very slightly, several questions have come in around globalization versus um, localization um, and, uh, and changes that we might expect to see there. Um, one I'm looking at here says, because many countries try to tighten their boundaries and borders, do you think we're going to experience deglobalization de in the near future, um, even after the pandemic? You know, is it changing, you know, the way people um, uh, view and manage their, their, their supply chains, um, et cetera? I mean, there's, there are some yeah. shifts, there, but I, I really wouldn't overstate them. I mean, unwinding globalization and um, very high levels of industry of interdependence in terms of supply chains regionally and globally is actually an impossible task. I don't yeah. think any, um, even the most nationalist populist government would want to try to begin that process and the economic cost would be huge. What we are seeing though, I think is um, kind of some selective deglobalization, like, as I mentioned, like trying to bring in a little bit more um, focus in some strategic key areas um, in terms of making sure that's uh, governments or countries have some control over aspects of their supply chain for those key industries, public health, um, vaccine, for China areas like technology, for example. So that's certainly occurring, um, but I really wouldn't overstate the extent of the trend and the idea that we're suddenly going to reverse, you know, decades of globalization because of this is um, is unlikely. And I think actually the overall story for the pandemic, like being able to get a vaccine out um, and spread globally um, has been mm -hmm. actually quite strong mm. endorsement of the, the system that we've been, we have developed in, in supply chains. Yes. And, and looking at that at, at a more regional level, um, there's, um, you know, question here around, do, do you see more cooperation within the region? Um, you know, we've talked about, you talked about economies recovering and developing at different rates, et cetera. Um, do, do you see a, a likely outcome here, much more cooperation across the region um, so that so that everybody recovers faster? I mean, what, what, what's your what, what's your view on, on, on how um, countries across the region are, are, are going to be, work, you know, how they're going to work together going forwards? Yeah, I think, as I mentioned there, just at the end, there's been an issue with the, there's not really been a strong regional response to the pandemic. We've seen some activity within certain sub-regional groupings like ASEAN, for example. Um, but overall, there isn't really a, a representative forum for the region through which this response could be coordinated. Um, this week, actually, there will be a, a leaders meeting of APEC, which will be interesting to see what the, the outcomes of that com, um, are. But uh, I think overall, the response has been somewhat underwhelming and a lot of it's been sort of bilaterally driven rather than multilaterally driven. So China's been quite um, um, been quite forthcoming in terms of vaccine support, for example, but it's been basically managing it on a bilateral level and trying to sort of develop some geopolitical wins from that process as well. So I think we do need a more coordinated regional response um, and um, I'm, I'm concerned we're not really seeing that at the moment. And I think underpinning that is the fact that Despite high levels of economic independence, there are quite significant political tensions between several countries in the region, and that is uh, um, something that which holds back regional cooperation at these, at these very important times. Right. Okay. And um, I think a question to end on. So, is it is it possible that U.S.-China relations could develop in a more positive way than you expect? And what would that take? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't ever want to discount that possibility, of course, we want to be optimistic. Um, I, I think what the outlook at the moment, of course, is, is pointing in a different direction. Um, so it's really just a scale about how bad it will get rather than um, if it could get better. Um, and certainly, if you look in history at the relationship between sort of established powers and, and a rising power, um, the, the outcomes are not always terribly positive, let's, let's be honest. So um, we are in for a tricky period. I think what could um, I think for a, a fundamental uh, reshape in that relationship, probably it's going to require some changes either within the US or China politically um, for, for that to occur. So their perceptions of each other uh, become more positive. Um, right. so, and the chances of that occurring are probably quite quite low, I would say, but um, be interesting to see if you did see some changes there, about how that relationship could reshape itself in, in the years ahead. Um, so yeah, never, never discount an optimistic outlook. I think that's important, right. but it's quite challenging at the moment. Okay, thank you. So um, we, we, we've 
just got a minute left, so let's um, let let's wrap up. And and I'd like to do so firstly by saying thank you very much for everybody um, joining us today, and thank you for your great questions. And um, and I'm sorry for those questions that we haven't been able to get to um, today. That's that that's often um, uh, you know how these sessions work out is uh, lots and lots of questions. Um, uh, one of the things that um, I'd ask you to do is, um, as you come, um, as you exit from the webinar, um, please take the online survey that's there. Tell us how how useful you found today, um, and uh, and how we can improve um, for the future. Um, we will also be in contact with all of you and share the recording, a link for the recording of this session. So if you want to share it within your organizations, within your institutions, or indeed um, you want to review some of the sessions yourselves, then please do um, feel free. And we'll also be circulating an article um, that, uh, that, that, that Tom has pulled together for us. Um, very interesting on the um, zero COVID strategy um of asia and uh, and so um you'll expect it you should expect to see that um in in follow-up as well so again um my, my my final task here really is to thank tom very much um for sharing his perspectives um experience and 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 the the eiu's um global um and regional outlook with us today um i think it's it's provided great food for thought. It's been very insightful and uh, and we look forward to the next session. So thank you very much, Tom. Okay, thank you, Julian. Thanks everyone for taking the time today. Indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye.